Sorry, I cannot uh, deliver in uh, Polish, but uh, I try to do my best in English. And uh, okay, it was my kind of uh, a wish to present some of the ideas I'm doing, I'm working with uh, for the last years. And um, I have a special concern on public space, and uh, my idea is to present you some ideas. And maybe this has a reference to the things you are working on or ideas we have in mind to you know how we can interact in public space. And the first surprise is that maybe this uh, little thing you are missing here in the city, that's because the uh, development of the city as Katowice is so much known for being a greenish city, but inside the city you don't really experience that so far. You, you experience that more in the, let's say, in the borders and the branches of the city to, uh, uh, to other cities. In a way, it's, um, it's about occupying uh, public space, and that comes from the idea that uh, I think we all experience this situation. Wherever we go, we are facing a lot of restrictions, you know? That's a typical experience, not only in post-communist uh, countries, but it's basically all over the world. So for this reason, I choose this pictogram, uh, this selection of pictograms in Sydney. As a lot of people would say, uh, Australia is a wonderful country. And it's, uh, it's like the United States. It's about all about exploration. And you can go wherever you want. You can do what you want, except you can not ride a horse. The, door, the dogs are not allowed. You cannot make a fire. You should not draw waste should not go with your own air airplane, no golf practice, you know. I mean, that's basically uh, what we experience. Then also, this is very important, wherever you go, you are expecting a fine. I think this kind of contradiction between the liberal status quo of moving around in the world, and also in the sense of globalization, is absolutely contradicted by the individual experience that you can basically <coughs> do very little. But there are some some basic things I want to deliver. One is that, you know, uh, everything that is uh, visible and recognizable as a movement in the city is, uh, is public. And the second thing is, if this is true, then everyone, so including us, our, our physical presence in public space is also public. And then every gesture made in the city, to my concern, is political. And I will explain where this comes from. This is a, a public demonstration of the so-called Black Square as I converted this into a public demonstration in 2007 in the city of Hamburg. I will come back to this point later on. My work is basically about observation. So this is a, uh, just an office building of a 1C production company. Uh, I observed this building for a couple of years. I could convince uh, 700 people to convert this building in the nighttime into a public sculpture. I didn't add anything else. So it's just what is there, 700 people, the windows of the structure and also the strong visibility in the city and then also I kind of orchestrated them to turn off or on the lights. This was the first week. This was the view from the other side of the river which is in this of this my hometown that made it easier for me to visit and speak to all 700 people. It took really two and a half years to speak to everyone. Also you have to be aware that people are leaving the company and new people are coming so you have to kind of keep track with them, you know. That was the second uh, kind of signature, which was visible in the night time. And then there was this first note in the so-called local newspaper. And uh, they, there was a woman writing uh, like a letter to the editor saying, the cleaning women forgot to switch off the lights. So that was the first reaction we recorded for this project. There was no announcement, no advertising, so people just looked at it and they either recognize it as a random pattern or something which has been done by purpose. The third week. In the third week we got uh, some problems with the people who are taking care of the birds and the habits of the birds and they were accusing us, we, we, and the company in particular, because the lights could affect their kind of habits. But we had to testify this is not possible in six weeks time. Fourth week. I'm just flipping through just to, to give you an idea. After six weeks, we finished with this, and then you will see this is my favorite reference to uh, Stanley Kubrick. You know, when you're in the, uh, the first third of the film, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, there is this thing, you know, this black thing occurring in the movie, and you see how the, the uh, primitives are kind of reacting to it, you know, so the strange thing occurs in, the, in their environment. And also in the end of the film, you see it again. So this kind of black 
thing which I, I saw is a kind of a concentration of energy is presented in the movie and so that's how it occurred in the city. The reason why I choose very simple uh, signals is because we are always in competition with other things. Like when I'm speaking you hear all the sounds from the bar and you hear, you hear other sound, soundtracks so we also have uh, lots of visual distractions. Traffic lights, neon signs, public advertising. And even worse, since uh, 1990 we have more digital uh, television and uh, kind of screens in the city which are kind of postering and changing advertising all day. So this is our visual uh, impulse and uh, I would say it's almost overkill. So for me it was very important to, to work with very simple structure to kind of emphasizing on the, on the problems, you know, how to interact with, uh, with this kind of public intervention. When I finished this in uh, November to, um, 1990, then in March 91, people were still writing to the CEO of the company that they have seen signs on the building. But that was exactly what you've seen in the first picture, just, you know, this random kind of structure. But because of the experience of six weeks of kind of orchestrating and structuring, people were able to learn this could be done by purpose. But then again, it was not me, it was just the, the workers, the employees of the company who changed this kind of patterns because they work in different working hours. So I did, because I didn't need any um, kind of extra budget to realize the project, I was kind of interested to how far can we go with a minimum of budget and also you know, to do kind of public interventions. I did a workshop in Bangalore, in India, where I uh, asked the 20 participants of this uh, project to take something home like, you know, this for the TV set, like a remote control. And we went into the street and we stopped as a performance with 20 people. We stopped the traffic in the street. We stopped the lecture in the university. Because, you know, this thing is having an effect. Oh, sorry, I don't want to go. But it has a certain effect. So people think that this tool can, even though it's, a, it's kind of this uh, non-visible uh, connection, uh, they think that there's something going to happen and it has this kind of connotation be because this is, the arm is a kind of a vector, you know, it's really kind of channeling um, energy. During the Biennale in 2009, three years ago, I was invited to, to participate in the so-called collateral event, which was in public space, and I was interested in this building, which is, uh, used to be a monastery in the 17th century, and then uh, um, Napoleon was uh, kind of conquering uh, Venice and he occupied this building and turned this monastery, he destroyed everything, he kicked the monastery uh, completely out and he converted this into a military base. Still today, after that, there was the Austrian and then there came the Italians and still today this building is known for taking um, responsibility into any marine and naval activities of the European Union. So if there is anything happening in the Mediterranean Sea, it is absolutely controlled by, the, by this uh, Caserma Conoli, which is the name of this building. All the people coming from Piazza San Marco, passing here, going to the Biennale and to the Giardinis and to the Arsenali, are passing this building without having knowledge. So my idea was to change with the uh, big light projection the kind of appearance of the building. So I used this three-phase uh, simple projection from a pattern into a word. This word, word intervento has this ambiguity between military interaction, it's called intervention, at the same time it's also very useful in the art world. So people use that term to kind of categorize their interaction in public space. It was only there for uh, just a short time, like two weeks. And this is another project where this kind of inter uh, intervention turns out to be a more complex thing. As you may know, because of its it's almost very close to the date of today, the 22nd of November, but in between the 9th and 10th November in 1938, the Nazi regime decided to have this kind of Reichskristallnacht, the pogroms. And what happened is they were smashing uh, a Jewish uh, community um, uh, windows of the uh, shops and also the, um, the synagogues. And most of the synagogues had been burned in that particular area, which is close to Cologne. This is a small town, it's called Stommel only 10,000 inhabitants on the left side of the Rhine Bank. The idea was that it, this place only survived because before 38, the Jewish community already sensed and realized that they wouldn't like to live there anymore. And they moved on from there 
back to Israel, to Tel Aviv, basically. Because of that abandoned building, the farmer took it over. In the late 80s, it has been renovated. And since 91, with an installation by the Greek artist who lives in Italy and has, teaching, uh, has been teaching for a long time at Düsseldorf Academy, Yanis Kunelis, the project started as the, uh, the project Synagogue Stone. The second artist was the American sculptor Richard Serra, and then the first German artist was Georg Pasewitz. I made a proposal not to take this small synagogue as a venue for art exhibition, but also to kind of reclaim the historical importance of this building. So my, my suggestion was to lock the building, this is the door, and put strong lights behind the building and create this kind of effect. So you are almost blinded if you go, if you straight face um, inside the window. And the idea is if you enter, you're coming from this side, you enter this space, you are going to the door, the door is locked and you have kind of the uh, experience of being excluded. I, want, I was trying to deliver a, a moment where we are as an art goer and visitor and curious personality are not welcome anymore. So this was a very strong uh, component. And I took this experience also for another project later on where I tried to convert this moment of being excluded at the same time you are in the limelight. So it's a very contradictional situation. Most people feel, felt uneasy in that situation. So they either started to run back to this place and were kind of hiding and were observing how other people are going to react on this situation. And what it shows here in particular is the relation between the synagogue and the neighbors who lived around. And that was something I observed. If you just create an art space, like, you know, Rondo Chuki or other places in the city, people will go because they know exactly what they can expect inside the building. And they don't really care what's around the building. So we are not now concerned about the traffic. We are not con uh, maybe concerned about the urban development in the city of Katowice, except we have a certain kind of, you know, awareness and sensibility. So this is from the family Zawala, and because of the children were sleeping in, the, in their room confronting these lights, we had to put some black curtain to protect the children from being, you know, uh, highlighted uh, with the strong lights, because we kept the installation for 24 hours. So it's another very conceptual thing not to kind of make it on and off in, in terms of the, of, the, of the daylight and nighttime, but it was about to keep it going like a conceptual work. It is always on, it is always in that situation to offend people, it's always ready to blind whenever you are ready to go there. Um, maybe I also should mention there are some problems during my art practice when you are invited, for instance, to go to come for to represent Germany for the Biennale in uh, Sao Paulo, which is a which is a nice offer, a nice invitation. But in the same time, it doesn't work anymore because we don't sing in this kind of national representation cat categories. Even though in 1998 it was not at at the point as we are discussing it right now, as you may sense that, for instance, for the German pavilion. Uh, uh, four years ago, it was in, in Venice, it was uh, Ian Gillick, the English uh, sculptor, who was representing his work in the German Pavilion. And for the next year, we have two things happening. Because of the tr friendship between France and Germany, they will switch the pavilion, and at the same time, Germany, Susanne Gensheimer, she's the commissioner in charge, she chose four artists who do have a certain relationship to Germany, but none of them are, are from Germany. So I think this, as a tendency, is very important to understand. And it's kind of commenting about the situation that we are thinking in transcultural categories rather than in national, cult uh, national categories. And if we are talking about art, I think art do kind of embody the um, kind of, um, uh, how to say that, responsibility to kind of react and reflect this situation. So in that, when I was asked to, to participate in the Biennale as a German representative, and I was the only one, I decided to completely be digested in the situation of the city of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is a city known as a, as a melting pot in a way. There's about 25 million people from all over the world. And I was visiting 72 families in total and I asked them to gather in their special location. This is one of the favelas we visited. And to, I replaced their private lamp situation. I documented this also with um, Donna Rosa, she, she also changed, and also with Luis and Manuel, 
and then we change this lamp on the. This, this is actually this is a, a very good example of the so-called Brazilian Baroque. So that's just for you to understand. So they come. These 72 families, they come from different parts of the world. They're representing different status quo in their society. They're also representing different uh, economical situation. And in this case, it's a very tough situation for uh, homosexual couples in uh, Brazil to show their lifestyle and sexual um, decisions into public. If you walk like, a, like a, a gay couple in the streets, it can happen that people beat you up. And you know there's no police interfering with that, so it's a kind of very crucial situation. And they both choose to present their life situation because uh, Biennale, as such, will have about 800 to 900 thousand visitors. It's it's more than in Venice, but it has a different focus. It's not like Eurocentric like the Venice Biennale. Anyway, the Sao Paulo Biennale is the second oldest, and for me that was a kind of a task to kind of insist and realize this project, which has a it was more about the foundation in the city and in the urban construction because we traveled 3,600 kilometers in the city to visit all the 72 families. It's an unbelievable amount of traffic involved to get there, but at the same time, it was important to kind of embed and include all the, the parameters I was uh, telling you a minute before. And what I did finally is I collected all this private land and put them in the center of the Biennale, which is the building by Oscar Niemeyer, who was one of the architects who built Brasilia. So it's about an, uh, another utopia of uh, urban construction in the, in the 40s and 50s. And so what, what we had, we had the each, uh, with each lamp, there is a, a little uh, um, small little poster which shows exactly the lamp in their private domain. And my lamp was never shown into public. So there was, this was kept in the privacy and their privacy was exposed in a way into public, but you know, represented by the land from the private domain. The debate which, has, uh, which came along was about this, the question of social balance, because when I asked the first person, it was the so-called copeteria. One has to understand in Brazilian society, people, for instance, are sometimes existing without a name. They have a name by birth, but the people are asking them to, you know, to accept to be called in their profession. So copeteria means the person who brings the coffee. And because that person may change, so you always say copeteria and you mean the right person, even though the person changed. But Donna, Donna Gloria was my first person I asked. She was one working as a copeteria. And she served the president of the Biennale. When I asked uh, then, as the second person, I asked the president of the Biennale. And then I said also, Donna Gloria accepted. He said, I don't know Donna Gloria. I said, this is your copeteria. She's serving you now for 15 years. And so I was kind of melting down the social imbalance in the situation they are kind of used to be together for such a long time. And this is something Carol or, or, uh, already mentioned. This is something to going to be on display tomorrow. So I started with this idea to visit all these families. But the problem was my, my shortage in Portuguese was so evident that I could hear the sounds and the histories they came from Mato Grosso, from the, from, the, uh, from, the, from the mountains, and they were traveling, or they came from China or, or Japan, and then they kind of assimilated with the situation in Brazil. So I said, if there is another chance to do a project like that, I will do one which is now called Newport. And the idea was not to show maybe this is Duisburg, and this is Essen, and this is Bochum, and this is Dortmund, for those who are interested in soccer, to just to mention the important soccer games in that region. But now I'm replacing the names of the city and also it's about new mapping, it's a new uh, kind of uh, cartography to show now which kind of countries are located there. And I choose out of the variation of 162, I choose 100 to kind of resample the idea that there is a multiplicity of transcultural activities in that region. Because everyone says, yeah, well, like Katowice is a melting pot of different cultures, but we have to go into one story to understand the complexity. We have to go from the macro into the microstructure. So I visited over three years 100 families. I recorded more than 400 hours of these conversations. Some of them are transferred. I mean, everything is transferred, but then they are selected for publication, which will be uh, also on display tomorrow. But at the same time, in this time, I, I was kind of concentrating on 
the meeting, you know, what is the, what is the meaning of if you meet someone and what kind of story are you going to, to collect. And this is uh, family Siam from uh, Iraq. And it was the daughter, she just fi fi finished her studies. And her brother, it's him, on the left side. She, he was giving he, her as a present a BMW, you know, just to be nice to, her, to his sister. And then I also asked them to stand up and leave the situation just as it is, and we made a kind of a second photograph. But then the mother appeared and she was kind of arranging, like rearranging, everyone was leaving the room, and she was rearranging the sofa, the cushions, because she said for her, in her culture, it's impossible that someone comes from outside, takes a situation like that, and will see like how people live. They, they don't want to leave their individual traces on their furniture. But you will see that tomorrow, in the exhibition, because then you have the both, both picture on view. The work itself, it may show you more than I can show you today about the reference I would call August Zander when he started his, uh, it's called uh, uh, the people of the 20th century. He did a survey in the beginning of the 20th century when he kind of documented all the different professions. And the important thing was that because we have this documentation material and we don't even have just the name and maybe the his or her profession. We can kind of recall something which is more than 100 years ago because this is the way of how we are learning from history and photography in this sense plays a major role. So you have Rengel Patch and you have Kertesh if you look on, on a certain period of time. And you also have some photographs, uh, some photographers who, are, who had been visiting artists and that, that's how we know how artists like uh, Brancouche had been working in Paris in their studio. So this kind of photography is very important to me. So, but I'm not a photographer, so I asked someone to join me. He has a certain expertise. He's an almost invisible personality. And it's very important because if you come to, some, to somebody's private place, you are interacting, as we know from psychology. In the moment we arrive in the place, we are changing the place. So that it was very important that we at least not even try to interfere with this personal and private um, sphere. And then, the, now, now you can see it, how it's going to work in the display. And then we also add the three different levels of video for the exhibition tomorrow in Katowice. We decided also to translate the German, if it is German, into English as a subtitle. It's a, it makes a, a picture looks different. Well, that's for sure has an effect. But we also thought it's important for most of the people to, who can speak English to understand what is the conversation about. The second uh, video just showed the people looking into the camera. And we talked about something, let's say, what, how do you see yourself being in your situation maybe in five years' time? And then the people start thinking, and this moment of like, being involved in their own questions, in their own world, is conveyed and transported through this silent video. And the third uh, layer of the video also shows the empty place. Because I believe that if we leave the room, we leave for a moment, our aura will be captured. Okay, if some, someone comes in and arranges the chairs or takes things out, it may change again into something else. But for a moment, our physical representation is still there. We can also measure that by thermal tomography. So we can kind of see that the energy was there. But it's not in the sense of, of thermic. In my, in, in my concern, in my understanding, it's more about that we create a space not only by the physical representation of the objects. It's also our body relational things. So I'm, I was very much concerned about that. So the presentation is almost looking like that in the, in the cultural center. You can see that tomorrow. Also, I'm interested that whenever we take a picture, even in a private domain, from someone we like, or just family pictures, with, where we kind of express our relationship, we create a relationship which, which goes back to kind of an idealistic representation of sculpture and photography. So I mentioned till photography exists, August Zander, just as, a, as a one example, but also wherever we see here Glaucon with the, with the sun fighting with the snake is a representation of how we think this could have happened because we don't have this kind of relationship. And it goes on if we look on, on, uh, on philosophy, like the picture we got from Platon, the picture we got from Aristoteles, is a kind of idealistic type, typographic uh, thing. So it's uh, iconographic more than it is really representing the physical presence of the philosophers who had lived 400 years before Christ.
So I'm also interested in that topic, and I hope you will get the chance to see it tomorrow and kind of explore the different levels of the multi um, multi um, media narration in the exhibition. But also, um, since I'm, you, I think you mentioned, if I, if I got it right, you mentioned uh, Alexander Basile and Dana, who, who, is, who are there, and also Alexander, uh, sorry, um, uh, Alvin Lai, who have been starting a, a process where they kind of starting to question the, rip, the, the function or the meaning of photography. At the same time, um, it's also a very good example of how students are able to kind of develop their own projects. And my emphasis is because I never studied art. So my access to the art is about learning by doing. It's very project-based. And when we started the minus one lab, it was for me a kind of a continuation on the question how we can somehow execute or elaborate a kind of a format to get, this, to, get to this uh, exploration. Because what I tell you here is only substituted by picture. It has nothing to do with what is really going on into the street. So it's a kind of a lecturing situation which has, is not my work, basically, okay? So what happens here is uh, there is a, an old building from the 19, uh, 1998, and then there is a, underneath the street there is, used to be a bunker. And the bunker was responsible in the city of Lüneburg, where there is a very big university with a strong arts department. And this bunker was not... Um, it was still remaining after the war because that was um, was not destroyed. Number one, and it was very important for the for the air control of the city of Hamburg. And actually, it was a kind of a Nazi headquarter, but with no visibility into the street. So only people know if they had somehow access to the bunker. So you have to go like an innocent person living in the building inside the, the building, like three different doors, which which you cannot re even record, uh, recognize as doors. You go down and then you are under, underneath the street and you work there. And the idea was of the students to invite artists who work with sound and light, and they, they had been talking to three artists to come there and to do an installation there. And then the city mayor realized, okay, if these kind of artists are coming, we are creating a visibility and publicity. And this publicity, even though this street has a name, which in German, already has a military connotation, it's called Schießgrabenstraße. So it is a, already it is about you know, shooting and uh, you know, this kind of military uh, reference, but if people don't know why the street is named like that, because of this situation, they wouldn't reckon the, the whole picture. So the mayor was a kind of banning this space and we were not allowed to go inside. And then the students were like sending me a letter and saying, thanks for coming, looking at the space. Unfortunately, we have to cancel the project. I was buying a train ticket, get there, and then we started to, to do it like that, okay? So, because we couldn't go inside, I decided, okay, then let's go over the street, and what we did with light is we kind of make a light drawing of the actual, let's say, ground plan underneath the street level. And the strange thing is, we got permission to do it on one hand, and in the moment there was someone speaking with a, with a megaphone, a friend, old friend of mine, Willy Krempel, who was at, at that point already director of a museum, but he, he's a left-wingish left uh, activist, and so he was kind of taking this mission on, supporting the students, supporting uh, the project, and then we had a, a sign saying that people should reduce speed like uh, 50 kilometers per hour. But then, during this speech, there was the first car crash. Okay, then the problem is that the dean of the faculty, he was stepping back being, you know, under his umbrella ship because he was afraid being sued by the, by the lawyers. And then in two weeks' time, we had like six car crashes. And the car crash was not because of the blinding of the light. It was just people were driving, maybe too fast, a little bit rainy on the street, and then they thought, ah, there's speed control. And they were kind of, you know, this brakes, works, and then no, no casualties in terms of... Uh, of uh, human beings, but some cars got some, you know, some effects. I was facing six uh, law cases, but none of them had been finalized in a way. And I was there in a panel discussion, then the police officer said that he's not able to protect me, because the people were really upset. This is the biggest lobby in Germany. I don't know about here in, uh, in Poland, but the car owners are the biggest lobby in Germany. If they don't want you to do things, you know, and also they can do, move things if they want. Okay, so let's get, get back to the topic I'm really interested in. It's, uh, it's this, this moment where we have this kind of 
corners where we can have we can somehow experience and liberate our status quo. This is uh, by one of my colleagues. She, Deborah Phillips, she lives in uh, Sydney, and she did this as a sculptural um, kind of monuments in front of the museum in a public park. And she's uh, complaining to me for a couple of years now that the works always has been damaged. But it came from exactly from an observation she made in Hyde Park Corner. When you ever have the chance to be in London, then you know exactly there is this one different, let's say, mentality or different perception. And it's very clear and easy to understand. This gap between where you stand and the floor has to be there. This is by law. If you don't use the soapbox or leather or whatever construction to lift up, you are not allowed to say what you want. I mean, we are talking about this city in Europe, the city in Europe, with more than 2 million CCTV cameras, so closed television cameras which are really observing public space. I was a lecturer, guest lecturer at the Goldsmiths College, as you may know, it's one of the famous schools in London. And there was one young artist, she was showing me, she made works in a cardboard. She was kind of partly covering with cardboard the pavement. And she said she was kind of uh, stopping the time. It was less than two minutes be before she was taken away by the police. So that is the status quo. I mean, there is this liberal attitude. And this uh, speaker's corner, as you will see, is a very historical thing. It has been always used in very different situations. And again, you know, and Deborah Phillips, she always was already referring to that. People were gathering and trying to find out, you know, what can be conveyed and what can be delivered from that point of view. Here you see the, one of my favorite artists, uh, Marcel Botas. In 1972, uh, he also came to London. He was uh, also interacting with the situation. And he made a performance. He kept the rule, as you can see. <laughs> and he was uh, putting it, this sign up. So in the moment where everyone was invited to speak out, <laughs> he did quite the opposite. And I think this is something which is, which is very uh, difficult to understand. Because we know about that situation because someone has taken this picture. You know, it's in his uh, uh, catalogue raisonnés, you find this as a documentation. It's not maybe one of his famous uh, interventions he did. And actually, he lived around my corner. He, has a, he had a strong relationship to Dusseldorf, and he lives really literally 100 meters away. And I saw him when I was uh, about uh, 10 and 12, and I could see him when, because he was also working in the, in, the, uh, in the middle of the town. It's called the Altstadt. So for me, it was very interesting that he chose he chose this statement for this kind of uh, uh, situation. And I think he did it because he also wanted to make clear how absurd maybe and maybe contradiction of the situation is that we are invited only in this particular corner to express ourselves. And this is the situation I'm a little bit facing here because I was asking not to have extra light here, but okay, just for the sake of documenting, we, I accepted it. So this is the situation where people are on stage. And so when the museum in Halle in East Germany were asking me to do an installation with the museum. I refused because I said, after 12 years of Nazi raiment in Germany, East and West Germany, the people experienced that this public space is completely controlled. Then 40 years of communist raiment, again, completely public surveillance, as I know from my, from my father, who, is, has been, uh, who, is, who was born in East Germany. So anyway, I said I'm not going to do anything inside the museum. I want to establish a public, public stage in this space, and I'm now I'm doing it in, 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 in Sofia again, as I was always looking for a second situation to have a kind of a um, comparison. And then I just started to do this in front of the museum with these uh, five light sources, as you could see here. Very, very simple construction. No movement, no flicker. It's not about disco, it's not about this... Uh, all the other aspects of staging, just to provide this platform, you know, because I realized in Halle an der Saale that people are still afraid after the communism, still afraid to use public space because they are now as the right-wing people, the neo-Nazis, and they're controlling it with their dogs, and they, they kind of occupy the space, and then, then they have this kind of hesitation, you know, kind of take, take over this situation. And so here is the invitation to go on stage and do something. And what happened, it also happened, is that Joachim Penzel, in, that, in this moment, he was kind of aggressively 
um, acting against my intervention. And he said he was reading silently. Again, that was the reference also maybe to Marcel Brotas, and I'm sure he knew about the work of Marcel Brotas. And he was silently reading, uh, for instance, Richard Sennett. After he finished the page, he took the page out, and it has been taken away by the wind. And so I think what he also is referring to is about this distinction between marked and unmarked state. I think this is something which, uh, in the form of difference from George Spencer Brown, is a very important thing. Because if you don't provide <coughs> this situation, and this, even this small soapbox is something which makes a difference, and I want you to experience that. Can you please stand up into the chair? Sure. This should stand up. Yes, I give you Can you please turn around to the crew? Can you say something? Whatever you want to say. You run? It's mine. Okay. I'm going to have some fish and some vegetables. And I'm here. And I also try to. Now? While, while, while I'm speaking or beside, beside you? Okay. Which kind of? Uh, it's usually a little sign that it's a consequence. It's about uh, actual work things and stuff like that. And, uh, Thank you for volunteering. Thank you. Give a, give a hand. To my team. Thank you. But maybe, maybe you can, you can tell how do you experience that? So standing, standing was quite stressful because I like uh, so many people and. Uh, Them. It was, for me, it was quite stressful because I don't like the situation. And here I'm just thinking about that. You can hide. Maybe that's why it's called hide my corner. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it's, it's also not, it's not fair because you, you, I had some time to prepare things. You were not being prepared. Maybe. But if you would have the chance to, to climb on the stage, get on the stage, this is only for this time being the difference. So that's why I chose the height of the stage. It's just a still lift. Do you, do you feel it physically in what, what it makes as a difference, also in terms of perspective? Even if you stand up, it's different. But then 40 centimeters, I, I really experience that. And also there is a very interesting artist from Berlin, Christian Azuka. He's a very, he's a kind of entrepreneur. He uses these traffic lights and he built a small platform, exactly that high, 40 centimeters. You climb up and you're watching the traffic. It's like you overview, like you know the old police places in, uh, in France where they're kind of directing the traffic and they were well, lifted up in that in a particular way. And he's playing that, is that a kind of experience? <coughs> but would you remind yourself, even if you have the time to prepare, to go on stage and address something to public? No, would you kind of take the mission, take the opportunity to speak to public? If you would. I have some time to yes. myself, but I think so. Okay. I mean, do, do, do you address something in the public sometimes? Mm, very rarely. I think this is something when I mean, you do it once or twice, and you become more confident, and then you start about, okay, if I had the chance to do it, what can I deliver? I mean, I could have done it with, with you as a leader, but I could also ask someone else. But it's about, it's about this individual decision. I mean, when I do this, it can also happen that you stay in the limelight and you don't say a word. And then you are in the reference line of Marcel Rosas and then you are in pencil. So whatever you do, and that's also very interesting, is just the physical representation. We are sources, we are material, we are energy. And we, people cannot, cannot ignore this fact. So if you just stand up, it is already, I mean, just to gather like more than three people in Beijing and the Tiananmen, will organize the police to take you into prison. Just the physical presence, it's not about what they lift up 
and saying on their posters and what they are shouting or if, if they do so. Just the moment of gathering is making politicians nervous in some systems. And I think this is something we have to consider as an artist. You know, it's not about the tools we have, it's about how we use us as a tool, as an instrument for, for exploration. Yeah? Thank you again. What I didn't tell you is that there was a webcam and people were aware about that. They could either use the web platform to sign in whenever they want to do something on the stage because we also provided equipment for those who are asking for equipment. So there were different kind of performances. And also I think what's also very important is that we have to accept there are different formats in public space. space. Like the parkour people, when they started, people didn't recognize exactly what they're standing for. Now they are kind of established and we know if this is going to happen, this kind of interaction is, is a, you know, has this artistic, sportive, ath athletic uh, uh, dimension. And you know, Livewire is maybe one of those who could kind of uh, use that also for kind of announced performances. But when it started, it was a kind of a guerrilla activity. And from that point on, I consider this as very important. But as I said, Joachim was, uh, uh, Joachim was dis distributing the papers, and this is also another paper. He was sending 100 faxes to art critiques to protest against my uh, dominance in public space in the city of Halle, which I think was very important because even though Martina was standing up, and if maybe not, it's not so clear what to, what to convey, what to transport, what to deliver, the moment you stand up, you accepted this invitation, is already a political statement. Yeah? This is, this is something we, we maybe need to achieve as, a, as a, a certain awareness in our life being, you know. And also, I'm not sure if he organized this uh, little collector to collect the pages of his readings, but it was, I think, a nice add-on to the performance he did. Now we are getting back to, what, to the very first picture, when it says everything in public, you know, this gesture is political. What I did, I was making an announcement. The announcement was, come dress black or white. So about 500 people appeared, and some of them in white, as you can see. So they were kind of making the frame, and inside there was black. But there also were people with a red shirt, and there were people with a blue shirt. When I asked this guy, he said, this is the new black. People were shouting in Smolensk, you know, the, the, the place where Malevich used to be. And there were people like a monk, a black monk, he was just walking his own pace. So after a very, very short time, this square becomes a long, long rectangle. Because it, if you don't orchestrate in a military way, you will never achieve this kind of formation. And for me, it was very important to explore and experience this situation. And also, it has a strong connection to Gregor Schneider's Black Cube, as you may remember. In 2001, Gregor Schneider got the Golden Lion for his house Ur, where he kind of converted his, his family house from uh, Mönchengladbach, which is a city 20 minutes north of uh, Cologne. And he was converting that into a kind of a space where he lived together with a person he created, Hannelore Royen. It's a woman which had never been there, but he created this woman as a kind of a counterpart. It's like a ghost living in the same building, has a name, has also a ring bell, but it's not living there, so it's a, it's a projection, okay? At the same time, he was uh, proposing this for the Piazza San Marco, and it was absolutely denied by the two curators in 2003. So he was fighting and fighting, and finally in 2007, on the occasion of the uh, uh, Malevich show in the Kunsthalle of Hamburg, he was allowed to, to position this black cube. While we did this presentation, he was sitting inside his cube, recording voices of people uh, going by skateboard or just hanging out there on that platform. We did this in the summer. And the interesting thing is, and this, this you have to understand, when I called the police of Hamburg and I was saying, I'm going to do this art performance with the Black Square, they said, we have to charge you 15,000 euros to protect the street. But if you do this as a demonstration, then you do it as a citizen, and then it's your right and you pay nothing. So the Kunsthalle stepped back, I was organizing this as a demonstration. And that's why we have a banner saying, you know, for more public art. I had to create a manifesto. And then we were protected by the police. And now you have to watch carefully what's going to happen. We are talking about 2007. In the same year, after 30 years, Bruce Nauman was able to create this inverted square 
for the Munster projects, one of the leading public projects in Germany, at the, um, curated by Kasper Koenig and Klaus Busmann. He was waiting for that for a long time. If you are in the middle of the place, you just see the, the, the edges of the square, and you're really in, inside a kind of involsive structure in the middle of the city. It's a very, very strong physical presence. And it's also a very strong physical presence when you are kettled, as it happened in 86, by the police for more than 24 hours. None of the people were able to leave the ring of the police. No toilet, no food, no water, nothing. And they were taken, it was very, very much criticized later on, it very much discussed, and it was, it's so different in how things appear. If you have, like, these models dressed in black and looking nice long legs, whatever, they were just having a promotional tour in front of the dome, no one asking them for permission. A lot of people taking pictures and they just enjoy it. But if it comes to protest, then we have different measurements in public space, okay? So they were very much welcome. And I was speaking to one on, and two of them, and they said to me, uh, they could not even speak German, they didn't know what they were about, it's just a, an agency were organizing them to promote the uh, European soccer tournament in 2008. I dropped this for the moment. Again, it happened in 2007. In the same year, I did this performance. And again, this is the black block protesting, you know, from the from the being um, from uh, emptying the squatter building in Hafenstraße. At the same time, you have not the the white dress but white helmet police. So again, you have a kind of a reconstruction of this image. So I was talking to the police person, and he didn't see this correlation. For him it was just another demonstration and he asked me why I'm not coming with more ideas after this. Because there are so less demonstrations these days. So there is a kind of a withdrawal from our presence, you know, to speak out in public. Even in Germany where we would kind of consider we have a kind of quite a stable democracy. And this was uh, the maquette for my project for Hamburg. It was taken by Edward Honcha's uh, demonstration in Tirana in Albania in the communist time. I just converted the people to be black in the middle and I took away the red ribbons of the, of the ladies around on, on the right and I put this as a poster. And then Boris Groys was going to publish this book for MIT Press and he asked me to contribute with the cover. But I offered him the picture, the one where you really could see the, the people walking in the street. He refused, arguing that he likes more the idea of the black public uh, black square as a demonstration rather than the execution of it. And the next thing is then you end up in a bookshelf in a New York bookstore. Thank you.